G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We're back for another week. James is here. How are you doing, James? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm great, mate. Scott, you're here as well. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, before we jump in... <laughs> <laughs> before we... I'm not lying. I thought you got lost in your own train of thought. It does. <laughs> it happens often. The train goes off track, but I'm well and truly dialed today. Well, before we get back on track, uh, I do want to start with something. Last week, we spoke about the F-150 being recalled mm -hmm. yet again. Yeah, and how dare we? I know. Um, we were accused in some comments of bias and an agenda against Ford. Now, I just want to go on the record and say I am a massive Ford fan, uh, have been forever. Uh, I don't know about you guys how you fit into that, but from a racing perspective. Oh, look, in, in the last week, I think on four different stories, we've been accused of bias, taking money from oil companies, electric car yeah. companies, in particular car companies. Yeah. I mean, and if we're taking money from both electric and oil, yeah. I think good on us. Well, but if I were taking money from any of those people, I can tell you right now, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, that's true. I would be sleeping in a bed full of coins, Scrooge McDuck style. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. Scrooge so anyway, to alleviate any uh, accusations of bias or agendas, I'm just going to run through all of the recalls that we have listed on the Car Expert website <laughs> since December last year. Take a deep breath. All right, here we go. Volvo XC40, Volkswagen Golf, Arteon, Passat, Kia Carnival. <laughs> Sorry, what's a Passat? Isn't that what it is? Passat. Oh, Passat, Kia Carnival, Audi e-tron GT, Tesla Model 3 and Tesla Model Y. James, did you want to take some of these? Because I'm running out of breath. Yeah, OK. Um, on the VW train again, Volkswagen Caddy, Range Rover and Range Rover Sport. Range Rover Sport again. <laughs> <laughs> Nissan Navara, Tesla model ambiguous. I think that was, that was a 1.3 million Tesla as a record. Yes, a range wide. Yes. Yeah, Volvo XC90, Mercedes GLE, Ford Mustang, Ram 1500. Do you want to take it from here, Scott? <laughs> Lotus Amira, Toyota Supra, McLaren Archura, Range Rover and Range Rover Sport again, again. Toyota Yaris, Mazda BT50, GWM Aura, Audi A4, A5, TT, Q3, Q7, Q8, Volkswagen Amarok, Porsche 911. And the F-150 twice. Can I just actually say something serious about this? I know we're being smart asses here, but I suppose like this idea that we're picking on Ford, I can understand why people might think that, because there's a lot of recalls and we've talked about two of them on the same brand in consecutive weeks. The reason it's so interesting, I think, is it's down to, for one, the size of Ford in Australia, but also there's a lot more that's gone into making this F-150 for Australia and a lot of history behind it that means that the process of rolling it out is really fascinating. And that's what we, when we sit down to put this podcast together, think about. It's not, we hate Ford, let's pick on them, but more, we know that there's a lot of context around the recalls. We know it has broader significance and that's why we're talking about it. So... I hope that does kind of explain why we think it's newsworthy and why we think it's worth chatting about. Yeah, I think that covers it. So hopefully that removes any question of bias. Um, we, we report on all of them. Uh, and just because we don't talk about the podcast doesn't mean we as a company haven't talked about it because it's all on the website. Can you now put a picture of a bald eagle wearing a Ford jacket or something <laughs> soaring across the screen just to really round this out nicely? I'm sure I can ask some AI to make yeah, that up perfect. for me. Yeah. Okay, let's, talk, uh, let's move on to um, the, our actual topics for the day. So uh, straight up, uh, New Macan. It is yeah. finally out. It's been... The old one came out... The, the current one came out in 2013, 2014? Oh, it's about 10 years on now. Yeah, it's been a long time, but it, I don't feel it's aged that badly. I think it's aged quite nicely. Mm. Um, but the new one, it's probably dividing people's opinions a little bit, so I'll open up to the floor. Just initial impressions, what do you guys think of it? I think I'll let Mr. Porsche speak. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I was looking at you because I know you've got some thoughts. You've been playing on the configurator. Also um, the best tool <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to say age before beauty, but neither works here. Um, yeah, look, the, the switch to electric is really significant, and that's why this is the car that I am most excited to hopefully drive this year. Um, it's Porsche's bestseller, and it's its bestseller by the length of the straight. It's this and the Cayenne. 800,000 cars since they started making yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Is an insane number. So this is really significant because obviously Porsche is going from selling a petrol car in a popular segment to selling an electric version only. They're killing the petrol in Australia later this year. It's going to follow in Europe as well as they move across to electric power. Um, I think this looks mostly good from the outside, at least. I love the front end. I'm not quite sold on the back, but James and I, we've been talking about this. It's growing on me. And I think the performance figures can't be argued with. So it'll do 0 to 100 in 5.2 seconds for the base model, 3.3 seconds for the turbo. Which won't have a turbo. Let's just be clear. No. It's just the way that Porsche... <laughs> labels their cars. I mean, in the same way that the Tesla with autopilot doesn't have autopilot. Yes, or uh, fly. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not going to hold Porsche to account yeah. too much for that. 100 kilowatt hour battery, and it's got a similar version um, of the charging tech that's in the Taycan, which means it can be charged up to 270 kilowatts. That is up there with the fastest in the industry alongside Hyundai and Kia, and it means that 
a 15 or 20 minute charge will get you from 10 to 80%. Um, JWO, what are your thoughts on what this means for Porsche and Audi? Because under the skin, this Macan is all new and it's going to spawn a lot more models. Yeah, so the, this is based on the uh, platform premium electric, I think, or PPE for short. And um, the first Audi that will get this platform is the new Q6 e-tron. So in the same way that the current Macan is very, very um, related under the skin to the Q5, the new electric Macan and the Audi Q6 e-tron will be very, very similar underneath as well. Um, they've gone for two, uh, you know, all-wheel drive models with pretty significant range like you know 500 kilometers even for the turbo is still a pretty good figure and you know this is a big big-ish car it's like 4.7 meters long it's quite wide it's going to be quite heavy as well but you know being a Porsche there's a lot of claims around handling and performance and all that kind of thing and the design is definitely quite interesting um, I wasn't in love with it when I first saw it I found that some of the the rear quarter shots especially made it look quite stumpy at the rear and didn't really give that impression of the length and its proportions there's a bit of cries of the crossfire about the profile at the back from weird. some angles that's mean, that is there's, mean. there was a few there was a few things in there that you could sort of mentally think of something else, but I would be really interested to see what it looks like in person because after seeing some of the European outlets talk about it with the car right there, it's quite low and squat, and then you know the rear looks like it's a bit more elongated than some of the images show. And I think you know moving forward there will likely be room for perhaps an even faster model like a Turbo S, and then maybe even a two-wheel drive version like what we've seen Porsche do with the Taycan. They've slowly rolled out more cars. We might see a GTS one that's more focused on you know track handling and things like that. So there's quite a few things there this is just like the, the the initial rollout 130 grand I guess that's sort of right in the mix with a lot of other manufacturers at the moment it'll be interesting to see what happens when BMW releases the successor to the current iX3 um, I know that the Mercedes-Benz uh, EQC is about to get a generational update as well so there's quite a few cars coming in that segment and I think what we given what we've seen with the Taycan and even the e-tron GT that these may become like the the driving benchmarks in that segment so really interested to see them come here and you know what it means for the brand I guess it's, they're discontinuing the petrol Macan at the end of this year. So for Australia, we reported last year that production will stop uh, middle of the year for Australia, and the last examples will start hitting dealers second half of this year. We've also reported that dealers in Australia are really keen to stockpile this car, because obviously, although the electric is a new flashy thing and I'm sure it will have demand, um, there are a lot of people who like doing long hauls in their Macans and they're probably still going to want the petrol. So. Just because you're not going to be able to order one new from the middle of this year doesn't mean you won't be able to get one. I wouldn't be surprised to see our local, local Porsche dealer, I know you live near one, with a big car park of Macans out the back selling as demonstrators because they know that there is still demand for that car. I also found it really interesting from the European coverage that in Europe they're pretty much um, discontinuing the petrol one now because it doesn't meet like cyber security laws but in the UK it's not subject to the same regulations so it's going to be in the UK for a little bit longer and you know Australia will still get them for a little while but it'll be interesting to see depending on which region how long they're both sold alongside each other or just completely um, move to electric from here on. I do have a lot of respect for Porsche in in the way that it does do things definitively. I mean, we look at their history and the 911, obviously going from air to water cooled was a significant shift, electric power steering a significant shift, turbocharging, even things like introducing the Boxster and the Cayenne in the 90s and the early 2000s, which were really controversial moves at the time. They, as a company, seem to really commit to changes and do it properly. And I think when you look at some brands talking about going electric, where they're gonna sell a new electric car alongside the old petrol version that's been facelifted again. It, it sort of creates doubt in my mind as to how committed they are. It seems like they want a finger in both pies and I know that there's no doubt they've invested properly in the electric stuff, but as a brand, it doesn't position them as a leader, it positions them as someone hedging their bets. I think Porsche will lose sales over this. There is no doubt to me that this electric Macan won't sell as strongly as the petrol model, at least for the next year or so. But I do think as well that in the same way that the box to help save the company, the Cayenne then took it somewhere new. By committing to this electric Macan and really saying, this is where we see the future and this is how we're doing it, it kind of keeps its status as a leader. And I, I do have a lot of respect for that. It's interesting because the petrol Macan you can get into for a lot less than what this EV is going to mm. cost. Because they have a, a two litre turbo. Yeah, you're around $100,000 as opposed yeah. to 135 Australian, something like that. Yeah, so I guess you could, like for a lot of people it was like an accessible Porsche that they could have and it was still a family car. What I'm curious about, and you said that 
Porsche hedging their bets a little bit. We know that Porsche have been spending a lot of time and money and developing infrastructure for biofuels. Yeah. Now, does this sort of signal that maybe they're less interested in that, or is this just, a, like you said, keeping a finger in each pie? Well, just to be clear, sorry, I think Porsche is actually doing the opposite. I don't think it's trying to keep a finger in each pie. I think it's committing to electric, and the fact that Petrol McCann's going away is proof of that. They're not trying to do both. Uh, the e-fuels thing, which is a little different to biofuels, is still going on. It's a very challenging technical process because what they essentially do, and this is a very top-level explanation, I'm not a scientist, so please don't come for me, but they uh, essentially try to create clean hydrogen and then capture carbon from the atmosphere and combine the two to create something that will fire like petrol in your car. It's a very complicated process, it's a very new process, and it's one that at scale does not really work. So. Uh, although we've had people in the UK and um, European outlets driving cars powered by that fuel, it's going to be expensive initially and it's going to be made in small batches. And I think the way Porsche sees it is not so much as the future of motoring, but rather a way for them to keep their old cars on the road. So you drive your Macan daily, but you pull out your, your old 911 on the weekend and run it on these fuels. And also as a way to help stoke change in the aviation, the shipping, other industries where it's harder to go electric. Um, it's a very different thing and I, I think it'll, it'll maybe let Porsche keep the 911 for longer than it otherwise would have. It'll allow it to keep its heritage fleet on the road and keep its old owners happy as well but it's not where the brand sees the future entirely. Yeah, and I think in terms of um, Porsche positioning itself as a leader, you know, for what, not only is it gonna be the Macan and the Q6 from Audi, but that it, this will spawn numerous models within the Volkswagen group mm -hmm. alone, where the next A6 will be based on this platform. I think the next A, the, all the new e-tron models from Audi, there'll probably be more Porsches that are based on this platform as well. So it, they've, they've led the development on what is a very, very significant uh, piece of engineering and architecture that will on the basis of a lot of new models within the Volkswagen Group, which in Germany is a huge automotive giant, and you know that's that that alone is says a lot about what what role Porsche is playing in that transition from you know combustion, from you know decades of industry and experience, and then moving into this new age. Um, any time soon that we're going to see an electric Cayenne, you reckon? Uh, Porsche, I believe, has committed to an electric Cayenne. Uh, again, it's I'm working two from... years away or something. Yeah. It's not far off. So I, late last year, drove the petrol model, which has been updated. Um, my With that sweet, sweet V8. That yes, thing. correct. Oh, V8 yeah. that you love so much. <laughs> yes. I say you loved. Everyone, yes, loves, everyone so loves so much. It, yes. um, my understanding is that update is designed to keep what is becoming an old car fresh enough to get through to when the electric one arrives in 2025, 2026, 2027, somewhere around there. We're also expecting a bigger car again. So obviously Macan is kind of BMW X3 out of Q5. Cayenne is kind of X5 Q7. We're expecting a BMW X7 sized or similar electric SUV to sit at the top of the range. When that'll appear, what it'll be built on, who knows, but I think Porsche confirmed that recently as well. Okay, so that'll be sort of Q8-y sort of? Uh, call it X7 or Merc GLS. The Q8 is kind of a sporty version of the Q7, so different thing again in the Audi world. Okay. Good luck keeping up with that yes. alphabet soup. <laughs> That's a lot of letters and numbers there. Okay, well, look, um, what do you guys think of the electric Porsche Macan? Uh, I think we all think it looks pretty good from the front, so-so from the back, yep. um, but it's, it's going to go like stinks. So <laughs> and well, we know it's going to drive well. That Taycan is, is, drives really, yeah, really absolutely. well. It's a fantastic thing. So I think Porsche, uh, they probably know what they're doing. Let's be honest, they probably are. We're going to find out soon enough. I think there's a global drive at some point this year and I'm looking forward to reading whoever goes review of that. Yep. Oh, well, we will report back. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we're going to talk about Ford again. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, no, well, we're not talking about Ford so much as we are Lincoln, which is uh, like what Lexus is to Toyota in America. Lincoln is the luxury arm of Ford. Um, basically, they've unveiled a 48-inch screen. In car screen. In car screen. A 48 inch in car screen. Getting into the television business. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, 48 inch in car screen. Basically, the images that show, and it's in, I can't remember what uh, spec or what model it was, but basically, their big SUV. Um, it, it covers from one side of the car to the other. Like, it is, it is ridiculous. And then, you know, 48 inches, you think of a TV, that's a fairly decent sized TV. I think the, uh, the way that it's measured as well, it's not necessarily a full 48 inch. TV, but it's measured diagonally and it's a very long screen, yes. so it goes from one corner to the other. Yes, so um, quite ridiculous, uh, yes. but uh, I guess we've got your thoughts on it. We both, uh, we all think that they're ridiculous. Is it too big? Is that going too far? Uh, that seems too big to me. Um, uh, I th 
because that has too much for you to handle. <laughs> I, yeah, yes. It just feels like too much for an eyeful. Um, well, to bring this back on track, um, to, in the imagery, it shows that there's still a main central screen yep. in the cluster, but then this, uh, the dash is essentially replaced. Sort of directly below the windscreen, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So you, you still get all your dash uh, imagery on it, and then you get, you know, in the images, it shows weather reports and your calendar reminders and all that sort of stuff. Um, is any of that stuff really necessary? Like, do you think modern infotainment systems are getting a bit too complicated for their own good? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and you, James? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that all that extra stuff is perhaps nice to have to say you have it. I cannot think of a time where I was like, mm, let me check the weather via the entertainment <laughs> screen. Yes. You've got this big windscreen that will tell you what the weather yeah, is outside. Yes. And you know you have a temperature readout in most modern cars now that'll tell you what it is outside anyway. So to overcomplicate it and potentially just cause so much distraction. Like I, I may be in, a, in a, an era where we're closer to full autonomy where you're not actually focusing on driving. You can have, you know, this is the weather update and this is the the wind speed, not that you really, again, something that really matters unless you're in a convertible or something like that. I just don't see why you need to overcomplicate it other than just to, you know, be a tool at a barbecue and just say, guess how many inches I've got in my car and <laughs> <laughs> what it tells and me. And guess how big my dash is. <laughs> yeah, <exactly right. laughs> uh, but yeah, sorry, Scott, um, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, uh, and we've talked about this at length, yeah. I know, off, off camera before. How much length? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Sometimes on camera, who knows? <laughs> um, our infotainment system, um, and we've already established we think they're getting a bit too, too overcomplicated, they're good, but... Do you think they're even that necessary in cars these days? And I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I just spent three months driving an Outlander. Mm. That infotainment system is basically MS-DOS. <laughs> but then you plug your phone in, it becomes CarPlay. Yeah. And I don't need anything. Like, I can go in and check the hybrid features on it, and I could go in and get an owner's manual. Mm. But other than that, there was nothing else necessary. And I think companies like Mitsubishi are looking at it going, well, we don't need to overcomplicate it. Yeah. But then you get into your BMWs and your Mercedes, and they've got all of this tech in there. Do you think that they should just have an option to do away with them and just plug your phone in? I think it would be a nice option for consumers because I know, like, we drive a lot of cars and CarPlay is my go-to. I know it is for you as well, j -Wo. Um, I think from the car maker's perspective, there's two reasons they won't do that. And the first is data and branding. Um, at the moment already, there's a lot of data that comes from a car and that's stuff that we would expect, like speed and how fast you're going, where you're going, when you're charging an electric car or fueling a petrol car. But there's also information like preferences for your radio station, how you set the screen up. You can download stuff from the BMW Connected store. There's only going to be more of that going forward as we start seeing cars that are more connected to the internet and things like Netflix and YouTube and that sort of thing get in the car. There's advertising involved in that as well. It's going to be like Minority Report. Yeah, <laughs> genuinely though. Like that, that's the way it's going because if you think about the autonomous car world, the reason that car makers can only show you so much right now is because you need to be focused on the road, except if you're driving a Lincoln. Um, but when you're not focused on driving the road, all of a sudden that in-car entertainment screen is going to become a battleground for streaming services, for advertisers, and car makers aren't willing to give that data up because once they give it up, they're not getting it back. If people decide they want Apple in the car only and not the car makers, it's very hard to make people switch. I think the other thing is, as a premium brand like a Merck or a BMW, that experience is really important to the story you're telling. So when you sit in a BMW and it makes a fancy startup noise and you've got hand Zimmer noises in your electric car and all the graphics are posh and flash, it, it plays into the broader brand image, it plays into how they set their dealerships up and all the colours and the shapes and the icons are the same. And that is very important for a lot of people who are paid a lot of money in head office in Munich. So I don't think that it's ever going to happen. Would I like to see it? I actually kind of would. I mean, you could knock five grand off the price, and yeah. as an option, say I just want CarPlay. Yep. And happy give, does. Give me an AM FM tuner, yep. so that I can listen to the cricket in summer and the football in winter. If you've got an app on your phone, you can no, listen no, to it. When you're in the way. country, you can't. <laughs> um, give me some really pretty analog dials and a very basic digital speedo. That's all I really need from a car, and it's something that the more that we drive cars with really complex infotainment systems, the more it's reinforced to me that I kind of don't care about a lot of the stuff they say they can do. I just want it to be simple and easily visible at a glance and to work. And 
to be able to be turned off at night because it's very distracting. <laughs> where, do, where, do you, where do you stand on that, James? Um, I think it's a, a really interesting discussion and it can be very region specific. It can be very drivetrain specific. Mm. Something that I didn't really think about was when I went to Lisbon last year with BMW and sat down with one of their software engineers who was talking about all the new features of the latest um, iDrive operating system was that with electric vehicles, people are spending 30 to 45 minutes while the car charges. And so, you know, we went through this demonstration of them <laughs> streaming Bundesliga, which is like the German soccer league. And it's like, you know, we have this awesome new streaming service where you can watch it in real time and everything else. I'm like, well, how ridiculous is that? But then when we had the in-car demonstration where he showed me all the features and everything, um, it made so much sense because you know there have been times when we've had to charge vehicles at public charges and you're sitting there for half an hour and whatever and it's you can either just be like this with your phone or you can have something there and almost have like a cinematic experience and then you think about markets like China where there's a lot of people that will drive these more premium vehicles and be seated in the back and you know the there are these big rear infotainment displays that are hooked up to the same software and you can basically be entertained the same way that you would on an airline so I can sort of see where there are scenarios where these things make sense and they won't necessarily be relevant to every single trip that you take in the car, but sometimes it's just nice to have the choice. And so, you know, we've also got Apple and Android starting to filter out their smartphone mirroring into all displays of the car. Later this year, we'll see the Apple CarPlay takeover thing where you can basically take over the dash, central infotainment, and any supplementary displays in the vehicle. Like, it's, it's the opportunities with so software seem to be limitless now, and I guess, you know, yes, it's easier to say, yeah, maybe I just don't want it at all and take it off, but say you have a partner or somebody else that drives your car and they want to use the things that should be part of that display, sometimes it's just nice to have. You just don't have to use them if you don't want to. I think the last thing on this, I realise we've gone on a little while about this, but the way that cars are made is changing. Um, you look at a Tesla Model 3, for example, and all it has in the middle is the screen, and, and that used to be the, the outlier, but it's kind of the norm now. And that's partly because screen tech is really incredible, but also it's cheap for car makers. If you think of all the, the complexity that goes into making a really fiddly little button that only goes in one model, that only lasts for three years, and then when you update it, you have to change that button, you have to change the tooling at the factory, it's really expensive. As opposed to one big slab of glass in the middle, which is easy to do, it's replicable, and you can do it across your whole range, car makers are only going to go further in that direction. And I think that's why these software experiences are so important for the brands. Previously, you could tell you were in a Mercedes because of the way the Mercedes buttons worked, and there was this feeling of quality, and the click was you know, the same across all of them. When cars don't really have buttons anymore, they need to differentiate themselves in a certain way, and, and that's going to be through the software experience. Fair enough. Well, I want to ask you guys, before we move on, uh, what are your favourite and least favourite infotainment systems. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but James, I'll throw over to you first because you look the most worried. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really enjoy the Audi MMI touch interface. Um, the last one was already pretty good with the clicky wheel, but when they moved to the touch one, everyone sort of was like, oh, we're moving away from touch screens. But in a world now where everything's touch, but no one else has really done it well, I think Audi did a really good job, and Porsche actually, the mm. Porsche one is really good too, is that it's still very traditional or conventional, but it manages to bundle in all the things that you would expect of a new system, as opposed to something like a, and the new Merc one's okay as well, but like the BMW iDrive 8 mm. was way too confusing. And you know, you spend more time looking at the screen, trying to figure out what you've just touched, as opposed to focusing on what you should be doing, which is driving. So I think that's probably the, it's conventional but new school with the feature set. Uh, what about you, Scott? I'm with James on a lot of that. I think the Audi one is fantastic because it is super sleek, it's super fast, it's super modern, but it's also really simple. There's no learning curve involved. Um, I think at the cheaper end of the market, Hyundai and Kia's latest system um, in the new Sorento, which we're about to talk about, does a really good mix of looking and feeling modern, but also being easy to use. So it's not perfect, but I think if you're looking at the more affordable stuff, the very latest Hyundai and Kia stuff is definitely right up there. Well, if any of those infotainment systems interest you uh, and you want to get behind the wheel of one, we've got a great service that can help you get in there possibly cheaper and possibly sooner than you think you might be able to. 
head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and it'll take you to a page where we can help you find a car, you can, we can connect you with a dealer, you can speak to a friendly consultant who's based in Brisbane, who can actually walk you through all the steps and help you find the car. So you don't need to do any of the legwork, we've got some people that will help you out. So head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and if you do use the service, leave a comment, let us know how it goes. All right guys, so this week we've all been driving the new Kia Sorento. Now we teased it last week, uh, but, but now we're allowed to talk about it. Yes. So James, I'll pass it straight over to you because I know you've been busting to, to get your words out about it and what you think of it. Uh, and you went to the launch and then you drove it back from the launch and then have spent a few days in it around Melbourne as well. So uh, fill us in. How is, and it was, it was just to be clear, it was the GT line diesel we, we've had. Yes. yes, so yeah, we got the top spec diesel. So at launch, you can only get the V6 and the diesel for now. Um, the hybrids will be coming in the next couple of months with very similar upgrades. So I couldn't talk about it too much last week because there's a lot of things that they revealed to us at the launch that we weren't actually able to speak about. And so one of the biggest changes beyond just like the tech stuff that was fairly public for the last few months was that the new Sorento actually go, has gone through another retune um, locally. So um, Kia's local team, uh, led by Graham Gambolt, who have you know locally de um, tested you know some 50-something Kia models since they started this program, have basically retuned the ride and the handling to just effectively make it better. So one of the key things for them was better comfort, but also better body control. Part of that is the fact that the new Sorento utilizes the new frequency selective dampers that debuted in the EV6, which I think basically without being being adaptive can sort of reach it or adjust themselves on the fly so that if you're on like a high frequency imperfection and then you do something it makes sure that it, it's adjusted to the right damping force to, to ensure that it's still comfortable and handles well so it's like the best of both worlds um, and they've given it a, a new steering map as well to make it a little bit more dynamic or engaging to drive so they, they were the biggest changes because one of the things that we noted in all of the press materials was that the drivetrains would carry over uh, it's a really good thing that's been made even better. I know that you and I have both driven the GT line of the previous model, and especially once you got to the models with bigger wheels, because there was no adaptive damping, they could sometimes get a little bit terse over, you know, tram tracks or um, high frequency potholes and things like that when you go it's through. It's a bit busy, wasn't it? So yeah. they're always moving up and down. Yeah, especially for the diesel, because it's got the heavier motor and plus the all-wheel drive hardware. And when you've loaded up with people and stuff, it could sometimes get a little bit firm. And it's definitely a noticeable improvement over the last one. Our launch drive was through um, like Hillsville and Tulangi Forest to the Yarra Valley. And we drove on some of the roads that I would typically drive performance cars through. It's actually a route that Scott and I use when we do comparisons and things like that. And and I was doing this in a V6 Sorento Sport Plus or something. And you know, you think for a car that's like 4.8 metres long and nearly two metres wide and weighing over two tonnes, that it shouldn't be going through there with any sort of pace whatsoever. But the way that it now shrinks around you with that tightened up steering and better body control, it's a very, very impressive vehicle that you know is almost knocking on the door of some of the premium European brands in terms of you know how well-tuned and how dynamically sound it is. And beyond just the usability of the new tech, which we can touch on in a sec, because I know you had some really big frustrations with some of the safety stuff. It just feels like a really complete product. Now, I will still say, and I know people in the comments always come for me when I say I, I wish that it was Euro 6 and had stop start. And it's more in the sense that what, if we're going to get serious about emissions and fuel consumption, and you know everyone talks about the price of fuel these days and how we should have more efficient vehicles, we should have the most up-to-date drivetrains. And we're still running Euro 5 emission systems, which are now over 10 years old, and in a vehicle that a lot of families are going to use. And you know, if we're, uh, diesel is still the pick for this car, even though some people are still a bit funny about diesel emissions. The fact that it's not Euro 6 with AdBlue to make it cleaner, and also that it doesn't turn off when you're just sitting idling either at the lights are at the school drop-off. I think that that's, there's still something to be said for that, Whether regardless of what your opinions are on stop-start technology, it still is something that I think should be featured. And then if you don't like it, turn it off. So I, you drove the car last week. I then took it over the weekend. It was a long weekend in uh, Australia for Australia Day. Um, and I put four of us on board, all big adults, all of our stuff in the boot for a weekend. And it, it's huge, it's comfy, it's great on the highway, the diesel. I totally agree with you on the stop start. Uh, I know some people don't like it, but we sat in a lot of traffic getting out of Melbourne on Thursday night, which is just always the case on a long weekend. And there are long periods of time where you're not moving, where I actually would turn the car off myself, wind the windows down so that obviously there's fresh air coming in. And then you turn the car back on and all the safety systems you've turned off reset. 
I, I get that some people don't like stop start, but my solution to that is really simple, and that's, well, when you stopped at a set of traffic lights for a long time, press the brake hard and turn it on. And if you don't like it, just don't press the brake hard and it won't turn on. So that's, I think, part one on that. Yeah, my big complaint is with the safety systems in this car. Um, they're carried over from a number of other Hyundai and Kia vehicles. And in particular, the speed limit warning, which is Hyundai and Kia's interpretation of what's required by Euro NCAP, is just one of the most infuriating pieces of technology I have ever experienced in a new car. If it makes you feel better, my weekend was the same because I spent the weekend in the Kona Hybrid. Exactly the same this, problem, Every right? time I turned the car, I accidentally turned it off when waiting for the missus at, a, at the shops. Yeah. And then I was like, oh no, I'm gonna have to go through all of this all over again. Yeah. <laughs> so what it does is if you go past a 60 sign, it's got a camera in the front that recognizes the 60 sign. And then if you do 61, it gives you a bing. And then it beeps at you three or four times. So you lift off the accelerator and slow down to 59 or maybe the traffic slows down and it resets. And then you go back to 61 and it does the same thing again and again and again. It doesn't work very well. If you drive past work sites off adjacent roads, it picks up those signs. If you School zones, when it's right. not a school zone. <laughs> so yeah, here in Melbourne, it's a school zone from what, eight till 9.30 and 2.30 till four. But it picks up the 40 signs and beeps at you all day, regardless of what time it is. It is, it's technology that I find distracting and so infuriating that it would honestly almost stop me recommending the car. It also is something that one of my friends who's bought a Kia on my recommendation constantly complains to me about, so I'm aware of that as well. But I think beyond that, it's, it's really infuriating that you can't turn it off permanently. Mm. So you go into the safety system, you switch it off, which takes at least two button presses because you've got to do steering wheel stuff and then screen stuff. It's more than that. Like in the Hyundai, for instance, you have to go swipe across, press a button, press another button, then press a button, then... The, and if you're we'll already teach you the started driving... Time. <laughs> if you've already started driving, it's yeah. a nightmare. But the fact that you can't, in a car that you've paid, call it $75,000 drive away for turn a system off and just have it be off is, is madness. And it's not Kia's fault, because I realise some of this is mandated by safety bodies around the world, but it's a massive frustration in all new Hyundai and Kia cars, especially ones that is as polished and expensive as this. Now, speaking of the price, it's, you say it's expensive, but it's in terms of seven-seat SUVs, it's probably more in the reasonable yeah. bracket. So the 2.2-litre four-cylinder diesel, the GT line, mm -hmm. starts about 68 grand before you start putting options and colours and all sorts of stuff on. But the whole range starts at just over 50, which in the grand scheme of new vehicles is a really good price. Absolutely. For, especially for something that's seven seat with a V6. Granted, you don't get all wheel drive, which mm. I don't know, on a wet day in that V6, you wish you had it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's really like quite on the money. And that's always been the thing I thought with Sorrento's for a long time now. They've always been around this pricing mm. where they've been quite well Priced, I've said price a lot, but yeah, they've always been right in that, that middle bracket there where it's actually like a really premium car for a really good price. I said it again, we'll put a counter on the screen. Price. <laughs> um, a drink if Sean says price again. It definitely, it packs a lot of equipment for the money. And if you sit in the top spec one that we had, there's nothing in there that you could ask for beyond what's already there. So on that front, I think it definitely delivers. I do think, um, it's still, you, you say that it's comparable or getting towards being European. It's still not quite there, but it doesn't need to be because it's not priced in line with those cars. It is a really, really well-equipped, well-priced family SUV if you can afford some of the nicer things. It doesn't need to be an X5 because that's not what Kia needs to be doing. It needs to be doing affordable. So what are its main competitors? Its main competitors are Santa Fe. Yep. Uh, what else is there in that? Toyota Kluger. Kluger. Kluger yeah, and Pathfinder. Yep. Would you pick it over those other three? I haven't driven the new Santa Fe. Yeah, Sorry, I you're in the new there. Santa Fe. Let's just go with the one that's on sale now. Yeah, well, it's bigger than the current Santa Fe, so they actually share their architecture under the skin and the, a lot of their drivetrains. The new one will change that in terms of drivetrains because it'll get some new ones. But the current Santa Fe is a little bit smaller, so if you need to use the third row or you need the boot, the Santa Fe is probably uh, the Santa Fe is a bit smaller, and therefore the Sorento might be the better bet. Um, in terms of the Kluger, if you do like for like in terms of when the hybrid comes online, the Kluger. I feel like with most Toyotas, the only ones that we recommend are the hybrids because the petrol ones are fine but not really that inspiring and they're normally made for markets where, you know, emission stuff isn't that big a deal. So, you know, the, the hybrid Kluger is the benchmark for efficiency. The 
Sorento Hybrid is good, but as you found out on your road trip a few months ago, it doesn't necessarily have the, the touring efficiency that some of the other hybrids do. But well, you get in a RAV4 and go on the highway and you'll use five, maybe six litres per hundred. Yeah, this and that about Sorento six to was, seven. Well, no, the Sorento that we had, we were up around eight or nine. Oh, okay, so, yeah, yeah, it was really quite bad. So in that diesel, I averaged 6.9, including a lot of time spent sitting in right. traffic. Yeah. So that's that's a pretty good Very number. Very impressive. Yeah. I was getting <laughs> sub six on the launch and some of our um, highway stints as well. So there, because there's so many drivetrains on offer, you can find the one that suits you. And I think that what the Sorento does is that even though, like you say, it's not quite Euro in terms of how it... Um, is completely finished. But when you think, consider the features on offer, especially in the top spec ones, it's about the same price as a mid-spec competitor um, or it's thousands less than a top spec rival. So a, a Kluger Grande hybrid is 80 grand. So this is almost, this is about 10 grand give or take, cheaper than the equivalent Kluger. And similar story for the Pathfinder, which while the Pathfinder maybe has a plusher interior than the Kluger, is not all that inspiring otherwise. And, you know, the, the Sorento has, you know, the Napa leather and the panoramic roof and everything, it feels quite high end for what it is. And so, it, and the display tech and everything now is still also better than what those other brands offer. The Sorento is definitely, of all those mainstream cars, the nicest. Yeah. It definitely feels the most posh. So, yeah. And yeah. it has a seven year warranty. Yeah. which is really hard to beat. Yeah, so, so yeah. It's, it's, I think in terms of, and that's why it's so popular, and that's why people are still lining up for them. They say that their waiting lists have maybe gone down a little bit now that they've moved over to the facelift, but people were lining up for 12 months for these, and you literally can't go a day, I know in Melbourne at least, you can't go a day without seeing one, and plus they're all on like police and- Yeah, yeah. Um, they're very popular. Emergency fleets as well, so they've done a really good job at making that car, the car for ev everybody, because you've got so many different variants and drivetrains and everything that people can really find and the one that's perfect for them. Mm. So yes, if you do get arrested by a police officer in a Sorento, you will be comfortable in the back seat. At the <laughs> yes. I'll put you in the third row. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, okay, well, let's move on to our picks of the week. Uh, Scott, I'll pass over to you first. Is What's that because you endorse my pick this week? I do week? very much endorse yeah. your pick this week, but go right ahead. Uh, yeah, it's onboard footage from the Monte Carlo rally, uh, and it was a night stage from behind the wheel of um, Sebastian Ogier's Hyundai i20N. And he is driving on narrow mountain roads. There are people lining it on both sides. There's fireworks and flares going off. It's terrifying to watch the video, let alone to imagine what it was like on board, but it is such stunning vision. Yeah, they, look, there is definitely something missing in the brain of oh, rally drivers. That fear. Make the, they yeah, just have none. none. It's it, crazy. And I, I reckon they wouldn't even see any of that stuff. They would be so focused on six left, yeah, the, the pace right. notes being read like, to them. That's all that they're thinking of. So, All right, James, what's your pick this week? Well, hot off my um, binge of Drive to Survive, <laughs> I started becoming a fan of, of some of the drivers on the on the circuit. And um, Carlos Sainz Jr. put up a, a reel recently where his father, Carlos Sainz Sr., who's also a very successful driver, if not mm. one of the most successful drivers, um, just won his fifth or sixth Dakar rally or something like that. So he's like, I'm going to go surprise my dad at the finish line. And so he gets on his jet and goes and watches watches the race from a helicopter or something and then meets his dad at the finish. And it's just a really nice moment seeing, you know, two generations of one family who are incredibly successful at this at this sport, um, just, you know, uplifting each other and and, and, see, and sharing success. And I just thought that was a really nice heartwarming moment, but also I love, just impressive. I love that as a just a normal family moment just when the successful family. racing driver son hops in the private jet to watch <laughs> the successful <laughs> racing driver father from a helicopter in the Dakar. I was just more worried about, you know, as someone with great hair, I was just really happy to see right. someone else with great hair. <laughs> to be fair, on the flip side of that, there was vision that came out of Carlos Senior uh, last year was an extreme A round, I think in Sardinia or something, in the middle of the desert somewhere, and he's watching Carlos Jr. like race uh, Formula One, yeah. like on an iPad in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's a nice family bonding time. <laughs> All right, my pick is kind of a, it's a bit of an old one, but it actually popped up over the weekend. Um, if you guys saw the Barbie movie that came out last year, yeah. yes. there's a great sequence where a uh, Chevy Blazer EV is being chased by two Chevy Suburbans. Yes. Yeah. Now we all Subtle know- Subtle product placement. Yes, there was some hectic product placement. The fun thing was that I found out over the weekend that Chevy Blazer didn't exist. That car is completely CGI in that film. Really? It is completely CGI. So what they have is basically a, it's pretty much a, a buggy, like it looks like a Batmobile basically. It's all got just metal around it. It's like a big roll cage and then it has those little balls on it so they can 3D track it and oh. add CGI. So they use this car in movies to put any kind of car on top of it. Now the, the thing that made me think at the time was 
a Sheffy Blazer won't move like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's drifting, all that sort of stuff. And it turns out it wasn't real. So if you have watched the Barbie movie and you thought something looked not quite right with that Chevy Blazer EV, uh, it's because it wasn't. It wasn't real. Fun fact, there you go. Yeah. Movies, you can't trust them, as it turns out. Uh, that pretty much brings us to the end this Sorry, week. Just to be clear, Barbie oh. wasn't a documentary. Oh, just to be, that explains a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, see, I thought, yeah, the Chevy product placement was weird. No, nope, there was no other product placement to no, the rest of the movie. None. Uh, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Um, next week, we've got our big Q&A. People have been submitting questions, so we're going to answer all of those. Uh, and in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about the new Lexus GX. Mm. Paul is currently in America as we film this, driving that, so that's going to be a fun thing to talk about. Uh, we've got some other uh, exciting topics we're going to talk about, but we won't reveal them just yet. Before we wrap up, any final thoughts? I'm still blown away by the fact that Chevy Blazer didn't exist. Yes. That's really, I'm trying to picture how that all works. Yeah, it's very clever because there's even points where you can see it in the reflection of the Suburbans that yeah, did exist. Absolutely. Yeah, so James, anything from you? I think I've had Ken off, so. Uh, <laughs> there it is, there it is. We'll expect a check from Mattel for that one. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment or if you're listening uh, audio wise, leave us a review. Uh, we, we always like getting new reviews and like to hear what you think. But until next time, take it easy.